Many aspects of performance nutrition are the same for both males and females. However, there are a few noteworthy differences that, if accounted for, can provide that extra edge for training and competition. This talk will cover some of the nutritional considerations that are unique to the female athlete. First, a little bit about me. I'm a registered dietitian with a master's degree in nutritional science and work with professional, collegiate, and recreational athletes as well as non-athletes. And I believe it was during the five years that I spent as a college tennis coach working with female tennis players that I began to get interested in how guys and girls respond differently to exercise, nutrition, and training. Now I'm lucky enough to work with some really amazing athletes, a group that includes Olympians, Grand Slam tennis champions, national champions, and elite level endurance athletes. I really enjoy being able to put the science into practice and also the problem solving aspects of, here is this great athlete, this is what they're currently doing, now what can be done better or what can be added into the mix to get this person faster, recovering better, etc. This talk will be divided into three sections. We'll start by looking at nutrient intake. Taking in enough calories is often a challenge for female athletes. We'll look at some of the reasons for this and learn how to figure out what an appropriate intake is. In addition, there are also certain vitamins and minerals of particular concern for the female athlete, including iron, calcium, and vitamin D. Beyond that, there are a number of physiological differences to consider between guys and girls, including most obviously the hormonal differences. These will have an effect on body composition, preferred fuel sources, sweat rates, and even eating patterns. Related to the hormonal differences are the monthly cycle changes. Very few people know that girls may actually be best served by eating and drinking slightly differently during different times of the month. We'll talk about these differences and how you can eat and train right for your cycle. There's also something called the female athlete triad, which refers to three interrelated components that are often observed in physically active girls and women. They can occur separately or together and include inadequate energy intake, menstrual cycle dysfunction, and low bone mineral density. These symptoms are surprisingly common and have very large implications for both health and performance. And along the way, we'll put these ideas into a practical context so that you can apply these things in your life and with the people you may work with or coach. But before we get into the differences between men and women, I want to talk briefly about some of the similarities. In broad terms, the basic tenets of sports nutrition are the same for both men and women, and there are certainly many examples of coaches and athletes who have had great success applying the same general guidelines across the board. For example, optimal hydration is important for sustaining exercise capacity, particularly in the heat, and men and women both see decreased performance when underhydrated. But on a more nuanced level, how to achieve that optimal hydration can vary during different times of the female cycle. Again, while some of the subtleties may vary, carbohydrate provides the main fuel source during high-intensity exercise in both men and women, and an adequate protein intake is required to build muscles and repair them after exercise. What I'm excited to share with you in this presentation are the lesser known but very important ways that girls can and should adjust the traditional recommendations. Now let's get started by looking at the nutrient intake side of things and what aspects women may need to focus additional attention on. Nearly every girl who lifts weights is afraid of looking like Arnold Schwarzenegger, but they should rest easy because the considerably lower levels of testosterone found in women will prevent that from happening. While the dominant sex hormone in men is testosterone, women have low levels of testosterone and much higher levels of estrogen and progesterone. Adding to the complexity, however, is the fact that these fluctuate throughout the monthly cycle and the fact that for some reason, the monthly cycle has got to be among the most taboo of subjects. However, having a basic understanding of female physiology can be of benefit to athletes as well as coaches and trainers. Let's now take a look into what's going on with these fluctuations so we can understand why things like fluid intake might need to change depending on what day of the cycle it is. Here's a basic overview of the monthly cycle and we'll look at each part separately. Starting at the top, we see the days of the cycle, with a typical cycle being 28 days long and day 1 being the start of the period. Days 1 through 14 are called the follicular phase, ovulation occurs in the middle, and days 15 through 28 are called the luteal phase. Within those phases, you might also see them further subdivided as early, middle, or late. For example, early follicular phase or mid luteal phase. Now let's look at the changes in body temperature. There is a small but relevant increase in core temperature in the middle of the month at ovulation it stays elevated for about 7 to 14 days. And although this is just a slight increase, it does become relevant when exercising at high intensities and in extreme heat. This is because a higher core body temperature can reduce the safe margin for heat accumulation when exercising or even working in a hot environment, thus decreasing the time to fatigue. This can also lead to higher heart rate and a greater sense of exertion during exercise in the luteal phase. And finally, we can look at the hormonal changes. 
There's a lot going on here, so we're going to first focus on the gray line, or estrogen. Notice that it starts to come up around day 10, peaks just before ovulation where it dips back down, only to rise up again on days 19 through 24. Estrogen can influence the cardiovascular system, including blood pressure, heart rate, and vascular flow, and even the brain itself, and promotes carbohydrate oxidation, or carb burning, while decreasing inflammation and lowering exercise-induced muscle damage. Because of this, carbohydrate needs are slightly increased during the first part of the month. Now look for progesterone, or the purple line, and notice that it stays low during the first half of the month and then comes up during the back half. In contrast to estrogen, progesterone lowers carbohydrate oxidation while increasing protein breakdown. Both hormones are elevated during the mid-luteal phase, or days 19 through 24, and this is sometimes referred to as the high hormone phase. This will be the time when the greatest effects on exercise are seen, and so this is the week when you really need to be smart with your fueling and training. Now this is a topic that could be discussed for many, many more hours, but in an effort to keep this practical, let's now look at steps you can take to best manage these fluctuations. For starters, you need to know which day you're on so you can plan accordingly. There are a number of free apps you can use for this, including Glow, Period Tracker, and many others. Once you know what day you're on, remember that the follicular phase refers to days 1 through 14, and the luteal phase to days 15 through 28. And again, the mid-luteal phase, or days 19 through 24, will be when you really want to take the extra steps in your preparation. This is not only because of the change in core body temperature during the luteal phase, but also because of the effects of progesterone. During the first half of the month, fluid needs are pretty normal. As an athlete who is regularly training, of course adequate hydration is always necessary. But the importance of hydrating becomes even more vital during the mid-luteal phase. This is because your water losses increase and it is difficult to restore your plasma volume. This can have a number of effects on exercise performance, particularly in the heat. Unfortunately though, it's not as simple as just drinking more water because fluid regulation is also changed by hormonal fluctuations, which means drinking a given amount of fluids won't always hydrate you the same way. As we can see here, this study had women consume a fixed amount of an electrolyte-enhanced beverage during both the follicular phase and during the mid-luteal phase. It may surprise you to learn that the increase in plasma volume was twice as great during the follicular phase as it was during the luteal phase. Plasma volume expansion provides a measure of how much of a consumed fluid makes it into circulation without being flushed out by the kidneys. Basically, how much of the consumed fluid got absorbed. The purple line shows that during the follicular phase, plasma volume increased by up to 6%, while during the mid-luteal phase, as shown by the white line, there was only a 3% increase. This means a greater amount of fluid was absorbed during the follicular phase and that you'd need to drink more in order to obtain the same degree of hydration during the luteal phase. Proper hydration is important because decreased plasma volume can lead to a reduced sweat rate, low blood pressure, and an increased heart rate during exercise. In fact, heart rates may be 6 to 10 beats per minute higher at a given workload during the mid-luteal phase compared with the follicular phase. So rather than just drinking more water, Add more salt to your food and even in your drinks to hydrate better by increasing the absorption of the fluids you take in. This is particularly important for people who tend to have muscle cramps during exercise and when exercising in the heat and at high intensities. Ideal resistance training can actually change through the month as well. One very interesting study looked at a strength training program that was based on this cycle. Subjects performed a leg exercise protocol either every other day during the follicular phase and once a week in the luteal phase, or every three days throughout the whole cycle. As we can see here, after two months the improvements in maximal strength were significantly greater in the group doing most of the workouts in the follicular phase compared with a consistent training regimen. And This is just one of several studies that have had similar findings. So while it's not always possible due to the competition schedule, given the option, the front half of the month would be the best time to perform higher intensity workouts and in the back half make it a recovery week or perhaps go for a longer duration endurance run rather than going for maximal intensity lifts or doing high intensity sprint intervals. Now if you do need to have a hard workout or competition, taking in carbohydrate becomes even more important and may be able to offset the negative impact on exercise that the monthly cycle might have. To further illustrate this difference, let's look at a study where healthy women performed cycling exercise for two hours at 70% intensity, followed by a time trial, meaning they needed to cover a set distance as quickly as possible. During the exercise period, they were provided either a carbohydrate-containing sports drink, or placebo, and performed the testing during both the follicular and luteal phase. Let's look at the purple bars first, which was the placebo condition. This was performed in the fasted state, and subjects performed the time trial 13% faster in the follicular phase compared with the luteal phase. However, when adequate carbohydrate was provided, 
which was 65 grams per hour, not only was performance improved, but it effectively negated any effects of the hormones on performance, and we can see this as the black bars. Menstrual cycle effects on athletic performance likely vary greatly between individuals, making it essential for each woman to monitor her own response and document the times at which she trains and performs her best. Now looking beyond exercise performance, exercise recovery also changes slightly. Taking in protein after a workout is always recommended, but it can become even more important during the mid-luteal phase because of the effects that progesterone has. This could mean having some chocolate milk after your workouts, which would provide the extra fluids needed along with the protein, or eating a larger amount of protein at your post-workout meal. Additionally, a BCAA supplement could be beneficial during the mid-luteal phase. And remember that increase in your core body temperature? Well, cooling down your body is going to be that much more important. Drinking cold water can be helpful, as well as taking an ice bath, jumping in a pool, or putting some ice packs on your body if it's been a hard workout in high temperatures. A diet that is high in nutrient density and contains the appropriate amount of calories should be the top priority, but taking things a step deeper, do you think that our ideal macronutrient intake should change with the cycle? Well, it appears that a higher carb, lower fat diet could be more effective during the follicular phase, while a slightly lower carb and higher fat and protein diet might work better during the luteal phase. This is due to a brief period of relative glucose intolerance during the luteal phase, which has been attributed to progesterone. Now you might be wondering whether this would affect weight loss. Well, one recent study set up a weight loss program that was adapted to the menstrual cycle. Carbs were highest in the front half of the month and decreased in the back half, while protein and fat increased in the back half. The control group maintained the same calorie intake, but without changing their macronutrient ratios, and the results may be surprising. Although both groups were in the same calorie deficit, those who dieted with their menstrual phase had significantly greater weight loss than those that maintained a static macronutrient intake throughout the month, and also lost more inches off their waistlines. And so to review, a typical cycle is 28 days. The first day of the period counts as day one of the cycle. The front half is called the follicular phase, ovulation happens in the middle, and the back half is called the luteal phase. Elevated progesterone levels, along with elevated core body temperature and reduced plasma volume, make days 19 through 24 particularly important. The athlete should use more fluids and more salt, as well as more carbs if they're going to do high-intensity exercise. Also, post-exercise cooling becomes more important, and it is possible that taking BCAAs prior to exercise can be beneficial, particularly during this time. Now let's take a look at how this can look in practice. Here, we see the differences in macronutrients during the follicular and luteal phase, as well as a typical day. You might have an interval workout at 7.30 a.m., so before that you'd want to have some carbs and a little bit of protein. After that, a recovery drink that can include carbs and protein, followed by rice with salmon and vegetables, maybe a snack of fruit, baked potato, chicken, and vegetables for dinner. Now in the luteal phase, you might have eggs and Greek yogurt for breakfast, which would provide a little bit more fat and protein. This would be followed by a zone 2 or low intensity workout, and you would want some recovery protein and perhaps a little bit of fruit after that. You could have a similar lunch, but the brown rice might be cut in half, and the afternoon snacks might be something like almonds or celery. Dinner then might leave out a baked potato and just have chicken and vegetables or salad. And finally, I wanted to show you an example of a personalized race plan that I might give and the success that can come when you put all the pieces together. First we consider your preferences for eating and drinking during exercise as well as your race goals. We then come up with an individualized plan that includes hourly goals for intakes of fluids, calories, total carbohydrate, glucose and fructose, and sodium. This total gets further designated to each portion of a race and a roadmap is created that allows you to know exactly what to eat and drink when so you can enjoy the race without doing math problems in your head for 12 hours. I also give you a packing list so you know what to put in each of your bags leading up to race day. Now all of this preparation and everything we've talked about won't matter much if the athlete doesn't feel better during training and racing. So I'm going to show you some examples of people who have put these concepts into practice. Nikki has been having a fantastic year, tweaking her training and making sure we're dialed in on race day. We have Sarah who's cut 25 minutes off her Olympic distance triathlon time from last year. Kelly who's a recreational runner. She's run several half marathons before, but leading into this recent one she did in San Francisco, she went in with a really specific plan of when to eat and drink during the race as well as leading up to it, and as you can see, she couldn't have been happier with the results. And finally, this very specific approach to both training nutrition as well as competition nutrition works on men as well. I really appreciate you guys listening. If you have any more questions about this or want to reach out, please feel free to email me or visit my website. Thank you.